Good. Thank you for that nice quote from a theologian. Some of the quotes from theologians aren't quite so good. You know the definition of a theologian, do you? Someone answering questions that nobody's asking. <clears throat> That's often the case, I'm afraid. Thank God for the real theologians who, who preach truth. Well, now, we're, we're living in a, a culture of moral relativism. That's to say... There is no authority, there's no standard, there's no rules. Each individual make up their own rules. What's good for one may be not good for another, and so on and so forth. We live in a world of, of humanistic atheism, where there is no judge. You do know, don't you, that one day we will all stand before the judge of all time and give an account. Praise God, those of us who have had our sins forgiven don't need to trouble about that element. And we live in what we have uh, kind of gone into in the past in a post-modern time. And there's a great history of that, an argument when it all began and so on and so forth. But post-modernism really is, there is no there is no objective truth. No truth, no authority, no judge. What a miserable world that is. But we as Christians believe that there is a meta-narrative, there is a grand story or plan that God has for mankind. And our responsibility, and I want to say this again, the gospel is not a, a mere subset of a few verses in the Bible. It isn't that. It's a whole story, and it's incumbent on us, upon us, especially those of who preached, to tell the whole story, to present the grand narrative, so that people might come to know Jesus Christ. And I chose a few weeks ago to begin looking at this grand narrative under the heading of the kingdom of God and I've quoted several times that lovely hymn that Sheila was reminded of when she was a child God has given us a book full of stories which was made for the people of old it begins with the tale of a garden and ends in a city of gold and there is a beautiful succinct uh, uh, laconic view of the scriptures hallelujah and goodness that people can write like that. And um, we shall see this morning how the kingdom of God is seen in the Old Testament and provi provides a foundation for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God promises he will have a people of his own. Are you part of that? That's God's promise. That's God's plan that he would have a people of his own and he chose Israel in order to reach the nations and the whole uh, purpose of course of salvation is to transport you to transfer you from one kingdom to another and I often ask this question whose kingdom are you in this morning because there are only two there are only two there is the kingdom of God and there is the kingdom of Satan. Hallelujah. Praise God that it's as simple as that. Have you been transported? Have you? Have you been moved from one kingdom to another? Now the theme of the kingdom of God was central in the preaching of Jesus. In fact, Straight away when he began to preach, it says this now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the king. You are out there this morning, aren't you? The gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Oh, that is a word we seldom hear, regretfully. Repent was his first exhortation, repent and believe in the gospel. And then in the Acts, you've got this, and I'm recapping and mentioning what I said a few weeks ago, Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him preaching 
the kingdom of God. That's what he did. There he was in his rented house, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And we tried to define what the kingdom of God was and saw that it had a future meaning. You understand this, saints, this morning. You understand, never mind all this business about saints as the world see it. All those who have repented of their sin and received Jesus Christ and are following him are saints. Hallelujah. I don't need some man to to designate me as a saint except the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saints. And God has promised that the saints will inherit the kingdom of God. There's an inheritance better than you will find in any human will. There is an inheritance that, that surpasses all other inheritances, inheritances. That is the kingdom of God. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the kingdom of God has a future element, but it, it has a present element because it described where the people of God have already entered. And um, you remember Paul's words in Col Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his Son the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sin. So we tried to come up with a definition that didn't have anything as it were in the future, in, but, but looked at the now. God's people, in God's place, under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. Is that where you are? God's people... In God's place, under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. And I pointed out and reminded you that that was seen clearly in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve, Eve were in God's place, under God's rule, receiving God's blessing. And that original creation was exquisitely beautiful. You know the word Eden means delicate. Delight, pleasure, that's what the word means. That's how God intended us to dwell, in delight and pleasure. And God, you remember, inspected his handiwork and declared it very good, and on the seventh day he declared it very good. And that is a description of how the world was intended to be until that awful day when sin was introduced into the world. And you, we, we looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and, uh, and uh, you know, this, this was not God arbitrarily saying, you must not eat of that fruit. It wasn't just that. It was the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had a, has a meaning in the Old Testament. It's the capacity to determine ourselves what is good for us. It's to place, it's to take the place of God. It's to say, I'll decide what's good for me. It's the very realm in which we live today. It's, 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 it's a repeat of the very thing that happened back there in the garden. It's as much as, you know, he didn't articulate it like this, but he could have said, I reject you, God, Adam, to God, I reject you, God, as the all-loving, all-caring, all-providing God, and I have decided no longer to live in your place, under your rule, and receive 
your blessing. You've put me in a place of delight, of delicacy, of pleasure, but I have decided I do not want you and I do not want to live in this kingdom. What a terrible thing. And of course he was taken from the garden and creation fell as well and the ground was cursed and challenged man's dominion and man's existence outside of God's place. And if you read on in Genesis, <clears throat> chapters 4 to 11, you get these two lines of human history. You get the ungodly line, expressing sin and inviting God's judgment. And the godly line, showing the purposes of grace and God intending to have a people for himself. And if you, you may have done this Bible study yourself. If you want to do it, trace the seed. Are you with me? Trace the seed through the Old Testament into the New Testament. And then we get to Genesis 6, and we've got a Noah with us this morning, haven't we? You're ever so welcome, Noah. As they stood and we prayed there, I said, this is doing my small man syndrome no good at all. <laughs> God saw that the wickedness of man was great in all the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And God chooses a man and he makes a covenant with a man, Noah. I went into this in great detail some months ago when we looked at the subject of the covenant. And um, you see, if you were related to Noah, you were okay, all right? If you'd come to Noah, you were all right. If you came to the man with whom the covenant was made, you were all right, all right? You're following me. And um, you know the instruction was... Uh, Put pitch on it, on the inside and the outside. Um, now the Hebrew word for pitch is kafar. It means to cover, to purge, to make atonement, to bring reconciliation. In fact, it's used more than 70 times in the Bible. And the, you know the, 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 the Feast of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that word Kippur comes from the word Kafar, pitch. You do realize that Jesus is our pitch, do you? He is. It's wonderful. These people could have had no idea what they were writing in one sense when they were using these words. Jesus is our atonement. He's the one who reconciles. In this is love, says John, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the word. Hallelujah. Isn't this wonderful? You have to read this book carefully, you know. And then the day, the day came when a voice came from inside, as it were, and said, come in. It's all finished. Come in. Can you hear Jesus? Come unto me. Into me, it's the same word. Come into me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Now you're standing outside in the ark and you say, well, which door shall I come in? Well, there is only one door in the ark. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Do you believe that? And God closes the door. Now, what have we got? God's people in God's place, under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. Praise God, he's done it again. He is not going to allow anyone or anything to thwart his purposes. He will bring about a people for himself. And no one will stop him. I'm so glad. And then comes Babel, you know, that awful time when they want to build a building that goes right up into heaven and make a name for themselves. And praise God, he broke the world 
up into bite-sized pieces. Forgive me, Lord, for putting it like that. Because he intended to have a people. He wasn't going to speak to the world as a whole. He was going to find a people. And he confused their languages. And Israel was chosen not on its merit, not because it was special, not because it had anything going for it beyond the Gentiles. It was chosen sovereignly by God. And I get weary when I hear people talk about, talk about kind of the Gentiles coming in as an afterthought. No! God, the, the promise to Abraham was that, that I will bless you, the nations, through you, every nation. Hallelujah. The Gentiles are not an add-on. They're not an addendum. <laughs> They're not a second thought. God chose a nation to bring salvation to the world. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? And then <clears throat> we get to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from, you, from your father's house. Of course he didn't obey, did he? He took his family with him. He took his father to Haran and his father died there. I put it like this, his old man had to die. Some of you will be following that. But he still took Lot with him. And it wasn't until Lot went that the revelation came. Partial obedience, partial revelation. That's a lesson for us. Full obedience, full revela revelation. He says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you notice that God was to give Abraham a name? They tried to make a name for themselves at Babel. But God was going to give Abraham a name. And Abraham has a vision, and God comes to him and says, Abraham, or Abraham as he was then, don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and very great reward. But I'm childless, Lord. I've got a child. How can that happen? Does it remind you of Mary when the angel came? She said, How? Seeing I know not a man. Well, I don't worry about that. God says, I'll sort that one out. God took him outside and said, look at the stars and count them. So shall your offspring be. <clears throat> your offspring is going to be birthed through a barren old lady. His wife, Sarai, as she was then. And here's a miracle. Here's a miracle. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. That is a miracle. The heavenly ledger suddenly changed. And instead of Abraham being not right with God because of his sin, God immediately makes him right. That's a miracle. It's a miracle when someone is born again. And only God can do it. Talk about a miracle of a child coming from an old woman. That's nothing compared to this miracle of new birth. Now they make a covenant. God makes a covenant. And again, we've been through this. And of course, some of you know this very well. The ancient Eastern covenant ceremony was to cut animals in two and, and have a corridor of death. You walk down the corridor of death with the severed animals either side of you and said, I promise. And then the other person would say, I promise. And if I break my promise, may, maybe I, I, I'm, I want to be like one of these. I can die. And um, 
God was about to make a covenant with Abraham, but there was no way Abraham was going to walk up the corridor of death with him. Because God knew perfectly well that Abraham would not keep the covenant. He couldn't. And um, so God put Abraham to sleep. It's the same verb as when Adam was put to sleep and he took from his side a bride. Hallelujah. It's the same word. He took a rib from Adam. God effectively was saying, I am taking full responsibility for this covenant. (laughs) You sleep now. Abraham, I am going to make this covenant and no one is going to have it broken. Remember the original promise that God said in the garden that there would come a seed, there would come a man who would bruise the head of the serpent, who would deal with Satan at the expense of his own bruising. Adam failed, of course, as did Noah, to keep their obligations. You could be sure Abraham would have failed if he'd walked up that corridor of death with God. Remember that verse in Ephesians, by grace, are you saved through faith? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And while God walked down that corridor of death, as it were, a promise was made to Abraham. He was going to be given land, the land of Canaan. Now Eden, as I've said, means delicate, delight, pleasure. Listen to this description of the land by Moses in Deuteronomy 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, sounds like Eden, and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which God has given you. God's people in God's place under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. But the years rolled back and there was no, rolled by and there was no sun. You know the story as well as I do. Sarai became desperate and became desperate and thought she'd try and find a shortcut to try and alleviate her own shame of being childless and suggested that Abraham conceive, should conceive a son through the Egyptian maid Hagar and she becomes pregnant and all that goes terribly wrong. And um, Sarai heard a conversation between some heavenly visitors and her husband in which he was informed that she would have a son and she laughed. Well, you can't blame her, can you? I guess you would have done too. And at the age of 99, she was pregnant. I want you to imagine her going into Solio Hospital on her stick. Zimmer. She's 99 and the receptionist said, have you come to see your grandchildren? No, no, no. Oh, you want the geriatric ward? No, no, no. Maternity. Hallelujah. When it all seems impossible... When time seems to run out, when somehow God's purposes seem to be thwarted, God comes. He always seems to do it this way. We have to come to this conclusion. We have no power of our own to bring about salvation. None. Paul would later describe Abraham in Romans as one who gives life to the dead. Therefore, it is of faith 
that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Father Abraham had many sons. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed God would give life to the dead and cause those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Praise God. It takes a miracle to save us. Absolute miracle. Better than any healing miracle. Oh, healing's wonderful. That God can somehow come and take away a stony heart, a rebellious heart, a wicked heart, which we barely understand ourselves, and replace it with a heart like his. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. Salvation is a supernatural act and cannot be brought about by your efforts. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. We know those scriptures. And raised us up to sit with him in heavenly places. Now, it seemed as if the promise was about to be derailed Yet again, in Genesis chapter 22, when God comes to Abraham, you know the story, and tested him and said, Abraham, and he said, I'm here, Lord. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will show you. Good old Abraham. And Abraham apparently unquestionably, unquestioning, arose in the morning, saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father, said, My father, and he said, Here am my son. And he said, Behold the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. What a glorious hint of salvation. More than a hint. You have to have blind eyes not to see this one, don't you? Take your only son and kill him. From that day, as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was a dead man. From the day he started out to the land, to Moriah, he was a dead man. Do you remember the, those words that came from heaven? You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now God says to Abraham, take your beloved son now and offer him. And three days go by the journey and he's journeying effectively with a dead boy who needs resurrection. <laughs> He believed, obviously, that God was able to raise his son up. That's quite clear from the New Testament. And he goes to the very place that Jesus was crucified. 
and uh, he puts the wood on the back of his son. Does that remind you of anything? Not some cross like this with a nice shine on it. A wooden cross placed on Jesus Christ with all its splinters and awfulness and all it stood for, the place of sacrifice. And just as the, the knife is about to fall and Isaac's concerned about the fact there's no lamb, they look around and they see a ram caught in the thicket. He's caught in the thorns. Does that remind you of something too? Jesus Christ, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Listen to this from Hebrews. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up, offered up Isaac, and that he had received the promises, offered up his only son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence, to, whence also he received him in a figure. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. God will provide for himself or himself. Praise God. You mean God would die? Yes. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, God and man would die. God would provide for himself. God would provide himself. A lamb. Oh, praise God. Remember John on the Jordan, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Do you love him? Do you love him? Do you love the story? Eh? Do you love the big story? Do you love the grand story of the Bible? I want to encourage those of you who haven't studied it, study it. See how it all knits up perfectly. God has given us a book full of stories which was made for his people of old. It begins with the tale of a garden and ends with the city of gold. But the best is the story of Jesus, of the babe with the ox in the stall, of the song that was sung by the angels, the most beautiful story of all. There are stories for parents and children, for the old who are ready to rest, but for all who can read and them, oh, sorry, but for all who can read, the more listen, the story of Jesus is best. For it tells how he came from the Father, his far away children to call, to bring the lost shepherd, sheep to the shepherd, the most beautiful story of all. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for your master plan. We thank you there isn't a man or a demon or the devil himself who will thwart your purposes and that you have prepared a kingdom to be inherited by those who love you. We deserve nothing, Lord, but you have given us everything. And Lord, while we've got breath in our bodies and we're left on this earth, we want to worship and praise you. We want to draw closer to you. We want to learn more of you, Lord, of this Jesus that we've been singing about and talking about. Oh, Lord, open our eyes again this morning, please, to see the wonder of it all, the simplicity of it all, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.